Thank you for having me and thank you for everybody who joined. Uh, I want to start off by thanking um, IUCGH, the Center for Global Health, for inviting us to give this talk and for multiple reasons. I think it's great to share the story of Tumaini, but even on a personal level, I think just spending the time to reflect on Tumaini um, has really been therapeutic for me. Uh, you know, I know a lot of us would probably rather be in Kenya or be somewhere else than where we are right now. Um, and just having the opportunity to reflect on a time when so many of us had a chance to be part of something bigger than ourselves, I think it was helpful for me. And I, you know, more than anything, I feel like that's one of the things I really miss about being in Kenya and being able to work directly with AMPATH is we, we've all worked together um, beyond our own self-interest and beyond ourselves for a program that addresses the needs that are much larger than anything we could probably imagine individually. Um, and so just another thank you for IUCGH for giving us the opportunity to share the story um, and reconnect with so many of you. I know these fireside chats have been very helpful mentally for me and just connecting with people. So I'm hoping we have time for discussion and we get to hear all of your voices. So my hope for the presentation today when, I, when we first talked about potentially doing a fireside chat was to talk about the story of Tumaini, not so much the statistics or the impact directly, but more the story of how it, how it came to be. Um, and the reason why I think this is important is because the students, the learners, the faculty who all come to Tumaini see Tumaini at different time points. And the people who come there now probably think it was easy to get to where we've gotten. Um, but I, I thought it was worthwhile to give, give the story, do the story justice and talk about all the different things and all the different people that made it possible. Because I can assure you that all of the people who are speaking today will very clearly tell you that it wasn't easy. And there was a lot of effort, a lot of hardship, a lot of struggle to get to the kind of impact that we have. Uh, and so for today, we're very fortunate to have Samuel Kamani, who's a program manager, who's been there since the inception of Tumaini. Uh, we also have Tim Mercer, who will be sharing his perspective as a student of AMPATH, who in the early days helped start this up. Uh, Dinesh Radhakrishnan, who was a Purdue PhD alum. J Dr. Jennifer DeBoer, who's Purdue engineering faculty. And then a lot of you I'm hoping know me. My name is Sonak, I'm Purdue faculty as well, and I've spent the last 12 years in Kenya. So my hope was really to just talk about the story from these different perspectives so you can see how the AMPATH model really makes these things possible. Um, and as we talk about the model, I'm sure many of you are familiar with AMPATH's uh, moniker, the, the motto of leading with care. Uh, and I think it's important to note, note this motto because it, it means a lot. You know, a lot of academic institutions come into programs, uh, come into countries like Kenya and focus on their own independent interests, whether it's just having rotation opportunities for students or doing research. AMPATH very clearly acts differently. Our first, last, and every priority in between all has to relate to the care of the communities we're serving in Kenya. Uh, and I think it's very important to keep that in mind. And so with HIV and all the healthcare programs we've started, we've always led with care. And what that meant for HIV was uh, when there was an HIV epidemic just uh, raging, raging in Western Kenya with limited response from anybody, AMPATH and a group of partners all came in and started leading with care and finding a way to deliver HIV services in a setting which had never really seen it. And part of the reason why this was possible is that we have a very strong partnership with institutions like Moy University, Moy Teacher Referral Hospital, the Kenyan Ministry of Health, which you can see the logo at the bottom. Um, and IU leads all of these activities and brings together a very powerful consortium of, of schools with different disciplines that all work together to help AMPATH achieve that notion of leading with care and setting up care services. And so you can see a lot of the institutions that are on here. Um, I'm glad to see that a lot of the participants on this are all represented by some of these logos. So thank you all for joining. And um, a lot of the stuff that we talk about simply would not be possible without your contribution. The other thing that's worth noting is, as I mentioned, I've spent the last 12 years in Kenya and just recently moved to um, Indianapolis. And I never quite realized how spoiled I was to have the, the quality and the diversity of partners that we have at AMPATH, where if we needed a cardiologist, we could just turn over or look over our desk and see one sitting there. Or if we needed a reproductive health expert, we could just get on the phone or just turn around and see one right there. Um, that is very unique and is not common in the US as I'm starting to find out. Uh, and I, I desperately miss it because it, it's helped me learn and grow in so many different ways 
um, and help the programs that we start be more comprehensive um, and, and more responsive to patient needs. So, so next, you know, Lisa, I, just to yeah. just to let you know, um, you're referencing the logos. Uh, I think you need to reshare your screen for the slides. Thank you. Great, so I want, I want to go back for a second. Great, so, so that you can see all the names of the, the people on here and the pictures that I was showing. This is my first slide. I guess it stopped um, sharing at some point. Um, so I, this is a picture of uh, the Tumaini Center now and I'll talk to you about how we got to this point. Um, here's all the logos of all the partners that I mentioned and then I'll advance to the next slide. So now I think you're all on board. So I, I wanted to just take a minute and uh, kind of orient you to the timeline of Tumaini, um, where we've gone through a lot of different phases of development and a lot of different phases of recreation of our model, all designed around the needs of the kids that we were trying to serve. Um, we've learned a lot, we've also made a lot of mistakes. And so I just wanna briefly go through the timeline so you can see what it looks like now and, what it looked like when you may have been there, because I know we have a lot of participants who've all interacted with Tumaini at different time points. So the, the timeline is, you can see it here, and my hope was to go through the different phases from the perspective of the different um, uh, speakers that we have here today. So the first one in 2008 was learning to care. Um, 2010, we responded to needs. Uh, 2014, we basically um, evaluated and refined, and then 2015, we decided to uh, recreate and execute our new vision. And so we'll talk about all of these different phases of our development um, throughout the presentation, and, and you'll get to hear the perspective of others um, throughout. So I, I wanted to, to, to give you insight of where Tumaini even started. Um, and, and Ampath frequently talks about leading with care. But to me, as I was reflecting on this presentation, there's another step that goes before that. And you know, to lead with care, you first have to learn to care. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to really um, reflect on this notion is that a lot of us care about a lot of different issues. You know, We look at the country right now, um, America that is, um, and you see all the issues we have, but think about how hard it is to actually do something about it. We could all care, we can all, um, you know, say the, the mottos that people say, but to actually do something about it is, is a very different thing. Um, and I just wanted to share you pictures from the early days. So, you know, a lot of you who might know Tim Mercer now probably don't remember the, the fuzzy haired Tim Mercer that first arrived in Ampath back in, you know, when, when I first, the first time I met him was in 2008. And so this is one of the early pictures from the early days. Um, and and the one, one of the things that I just want to impress upon people who might now know Tim Mercer as one of the leads for Dell Medical School is that the thing that I will never forget about Tim when he was a student was he found a way to, to make all of us care. Um, and, and that's no small feat. It wasn't just you know saying like, oh, I care about street youth. I want to do something like, let's do this. He had a plan for how to actually understand what they need and how to make others who are going to be there in the long term care about it enough to do something about it as well. Uh, and I'll never forget that because I still remember my early interactions with Tim. And I'm just like, you know, like, why are you interested in this? He's like, no, like we have to do something. Like Sona, come and help us. Elizabeth Chester, I see is on, you know, she, he, he basically corralled this whole group of people who all cared about street youth, but never really figured out how to do something about it. Um, and so I'm incredibly thankful to Tim for teaching us how to care. And, and this is what I'm saying to when I'm referring to leading with care with Ampath. There's another step that so many of us who work with Ampath have learned is that you have to first learn to care before you lead with care. Um, and that's the part that I think Tim really exemplifies. And I wanted to give him a couple of minutes to share his perspective um, from being a student with Ampath back in the early days of um, when we were first getting started with this and why he actually wanted to do something with Tumaini and why he actually cared. All right, thank, thank you, Sonak. Um, wow, it's really great to be here. Uh, I've participated in and then led many a fireside chats uh, in House One uh, over the years, but uh, never one with 85 participants. So this is actually amazing. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone for the opportunity. Uh, and I can't believe I let Sonak put an old school picture of me up with my, with my old fro, but 
those of you around back then remember, I've uh, cleaned up a little since. Um, so I, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, what you're saying, Sonak, although I have to say, um, I mean, I felt inspired and I think why many of us have called Empath our home uh, and you know, become lifers and never leave because we find a community of people and a philosophy of you know, a way to sort of live in the world and, and work. Uh, that resonates with us. And so like many of you on this call, I uh, am impatient with inaction and found such common ground um, amongst uh, all of you uh, with Ampath of the sort of, um, you know, antithetical uh, approach to inaction towards injustice. Um, and, and that really resonated with me. And I found a community of people who, who felt that same way. So you know, I, I had uh, just just to put it in a little bit of uh, uh, context at the time, I had um, I first uh, came to Kenya in 2006 as a Slamenda scholar after my first year of medical school at IU, um, and it really you know opened my eyes uh, to to a new sort of way to view health and medicine. And at the time, as you know, you put yourself in my shoes, I was steeped. I just finished my first year of medical school. I was steeped in, uh, you know, the basic sciences and the Krebs cycle and genetics and biochemistry. Uh, and then I came to Kenya and I really saw why, um, why people really get sick that had nothing to do with uh, a lot of what I was learning. Although, you know, I don't take for granted that foundational knowledge. And, and so um, I, I took a path towards uh, pursuing a, an MPH and focusing on social and behavioral sciences and really studying and learning the social determinants of health, which are now obviously so um, talked about and common because we've realized uh, how important they are. Um, it took us a long time. Uh, they were you know, there very squarely in the Alma Auto dec Declaration, you know, decades ago, but um, we're, we're catching up. Um, and, and, you know, then I, I met uh, a, a street youth as many of, of you probably did uh, walking the streets of Eldoret. Um, and it was just, you know, we all sort of, I guess, have our moment and our issue that enough is enough, um, you know, when we see certain injustices. Um, and that was it for me. And, and uh, I was surrounded by, you know, uh, again, a community that, that sort of supported that action. Um, and I think, you know, there's a reason so much of the empath philosophy is grounded in this sort of it all started with one person. The program started so small and we tell the story of the initiation of the HIV care program. And we tell the story of Daniel and that one patient and, and um, you know, the story of empath and the philosophy is grounded in that, that um, yes, we dream big and we're not risk averse, but we start small and start with the care of sort of one human being and just put one foot in front of the other and go from there. Um, and so that, you know, was, that and then the community of people uh, that make up Ampath was very empowering as a student to then, um, as Sonic said, corral others uh, that had more, you know, power, influence, knowledge, skills, access to resources than me uh, uh, to, to help do something. Um, and then, you know, very early on, and you'll get to hear from Samuel in a bit. Uh, so Samuel Kamani and I, I met and, and frankly just became you know, very, very close friends immediately and, and shared many, many a night and, and many a Tusker, uh, you know, just talking about the injustice uh, that we saw in the world, about street youth, about our backgrounds, I mean, about what we could do. And so um, really created an enduring sort of bond and friendship to address this problem um, and found that neither of us were, were particularly averse to taking risks and, and uh, starting with action. And again, that's the whole spirit of, of the empath model is like start and self-correct, right? So just, uh, just get going and do something, uh, learn, listen, don't be afraid to scrap it, which you'll hear later we did at one point and, and start over, um, but uh, don't be paralyzed by sort of inaction and waiting to get everything perfect. So, and then again, you know, Tumaini grew out of this. Uh, I did my thesis research for my MPH on understanding um, the, the needs of street youth. And uh, we interviewed uh, children and families and other um, people in the community. But again, I was supported and lifted up by the entire empath network from 
um, you know, Yusonak, Elizabeth, uh, Tamika, Paula, many, many others um, who, who steered us in the right direction and provided us uh, support. And so while uh, we were, you know, while we weren't an empath program, of course we were, and we were embodied in that, uh, uh, in that family. Um, and I think that uh, th those partnerships were key to our success. So um, I think I'll stop there. That's sort of a little bit from, from the early days. Um, but we just, uh, we really started, we, we always wanted to do something and it was always gonna be an intervention, a program of some sort. Uh, but we did start sort of with this process of, of listening and learning. Um, you know, from those who know best and those that's, you know, the, the youth we were attempting to serve. Yeah, and, and I want to thank, thank you for that, Tim. Um, I, I was hoping to have Kamani speak a lot more on this session, but he's not feeling well. So I promised him that I wouldn't ask him to speak too much. Um, but Kamani has been with Tumaini and is the, the figurehead and the, 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 you know, the guts and the, the engine behind it. Um, so Kamani, I, I was just curious if, if you could tell very briefly why you decided to work with Tulane and why you decided to make um, street youth the issue that you focused on um, despite having a comfortable life as a teacher um, and, and a very simple life. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm always astounded that you stuck with this despite many of the trials and tribulations. I'm just curious to hear your perspective and you're on mute if you could unmute yourself and give us a couple of comments. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Sonak, and um, thank you, team, for setting us up with uh, the story of how we met. So for me, I think the biggest p thing that made me start this was other people. I stand here as a director and as a person who has been here day and night sometimes um, running to my knee. But it is Tim Massa who kept on asking me about why, what we should do about the problem. So for me, I was just like enchanted walking around with Tim and um, Benson telling me, because I used to ask my cousin Benson who really inspired me at the beginning, um, do you think it's right for me to, to work with this group of children? I fear them because my experience, early experiences with uh, street children and youth was uh, me swimming in the local river that is just behind IU. Uh, it passes by our home. And, um, you know, street children taking all our clothes and we had to walk um, uh, through maize plantations to arrive at home because uh, we didn't have clothes anyway. So <laughs> I used to fear that. And uh, Benson used to tell me it's possible because Benson had been on the street. And um, he introduced me to the population. And uh, using soccer and the early Saturdays when we used to go there after school, because I used to teach Benson, uh, in the afternoon, Saturday afternoons, and play soccer with street. That's when I started realizing they had names, they cared, they used to ask us about where is your center. We hadn't even started a center then. So I, I thank a lot to Tim and to Benson for inspiring me to start working with street children. Then I got captivated by this work. And, and, and I think for me, the first child that I saw in, in school uniform that we had rescued from the street and we took home. That was it. From that time, I've been hooked. And um, I was telling Sonak uh, before this started that I saw a video of uh, the kids, um, you know, celebrating the start um, when the, 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 the pub that we made at Tumaini was being um, for the first time started. And I got really emotional just to see that those kids are now young men working and we have been able to work with them for so many years. And now they are there on their two feet um doing their things so yeah for me it's just the inspiration from other people especially Tim and Benson and then having other people who have joined us over time to make this one easy uh from you know Elizabeth Chester who taught me to save every penny for to mining if you went to Elizabeth Chester without <laughs> a change you she will return you so that, that was such one of my toughest uh, treasurers and I thank God that I, my treasure right now is not as tough as Elizabeth Chester is. So yeah, <laughs> all the way to Sonak and Jennifer and the rest of people who have come and joined us. Um, thank you for inspiration and keeping us going this many years down the line. It's a decade since we started to mine. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kim. So, you know, I, I want to keep going along with the story, but that's, that gives you a perspective of the, of the early days from a student, a single student who decided that this was an issue that was important enough to focus on. 
Um, and, and like Tim and Kim both mentioned, that's really what so many great things that we see today start from. Um, and I think it's important and useful to reflect on that and realize that. And I, I want to acknowledge another, another student who helped us learn this as well. So Lonnie Embleton is a student um, from the University of Toronto who finished her PhD recently, but was with Tumaini many, many years ago. Uh, and she came in and, and wanted to do this project called Photo Voice. Um, and this was basically a project where she wanted to give the kids a camera to tell their stories through, through photos. Um, so once again, we're not trying to solve the problems with our own mental constructs. We're trying to do all of our solutions around what the kids are telling us, what they see as the needs. Um, and so she basically did this project and I wanted to share a couple of pictures that the kids took to share their story. Um, and this was their effort to kind of explain what their life was like as a kid. And I feel like the pictures tell a story better than I could. Um, so I just wanted to spend a second on this picture. So for those of you in Kenya, um, you, you probably have seen landscapes like this where you see the trash heaps on the side um, and it's just kind of something that's discarded from the community. Um, and when you look a little bit closer, you see the picture of the street youth who's sleeping on that. Um, and, and this picture always gives me great pause where we could treat hum humans like that, where we treat them like trash. Um, and essentially that's the way the community treated street youth. And it's, it's a very sobering picture. Um, and once again, this is a picture that was taken by a street kid to explain what their life was like. But now I, I don't want this to be a depressing session. And so this picture is also telling because it has hope at the same time. So for anybody who spent a lot of time in Kenya, you can look at that, that fence in the background and you might, see a, you might see a slogan that's fairly common. And what you see there, it says, look, it says like much now painted. Um, for the Kenyans who are on the group or the people who spent a lot of Ken in time in Kenya, you probably know what the full saying is. And the full saying is, doesn't look like much now, wait till it's painted. And I just want you to pause and think about that for a second and how amazing a picture this is, because that is essentially Tumaini's approach to street youth is, you know, we take what people have considered as trash in the community, but wait, just give us time, wait till it's painted and you'll see what this, what this current trash can look like. Um, and so this one always gives me pause because it's a very depressing and disturbing picture, but it's what the kids wanted to show to tell their story of what their life is like. So at the same time, it also has this ray of hope. Um, and so I want you to keep this in mind as we look at some of the other things that we've done over time. And then here's another picture that I think is also telling. Um, so just to orient you to the picture, um, this is a truck that's passing, a, that's passing by with the billboard on it. Um, if you see that, you can see the wheels at the bottom of it. This is just a random passing trunk, a, a truck that's passing by with the billboard on it. And then you see a couple of kids in front of it. Now, if you look at this picture quickly, it almost looks as if these kids are part of that family. Um, and if you ever think about, you know, as you get to learn these street youth, that is probably the thing that they want more than anything else is just to be part of this family, be part of a group again. And that's probably one of the things that actually draws them to the street is that they create their own street family there. Um, but if you look at this picture quickly, it, it looks like they're part of this family. Um, but in reality, that reality is so far away from them um, and their current lives, because right now they're, they were struggling um, on their own on the street. Uh, and so I think this once again is another telling picture of just what the reality of these kids are. And once again, there's another message on this billboard that is also a, a, you know, a testament to what we're trying to do with Tumaini. And it says, dreamt of happy shopping, we make it possible. And so if you think and pause for a second about what Tumaini's approach been, has, has been over the last you know, decade, this is basically what we're doing. We, you, know, you dream of happiness, you dream of being able to do these normal things. We wanna help you get there. Um, so once again, this is another picture that a, a kid took to share their story. Um, and I hope it tells the story better than I can because the picture says it all. And so once we had uh, this basic backdrop of needs and all these things that we wanted to do, we started this Tumaini drop, children's drop in center. Um, and you know, for, for a lot of us, we for those of you who've been into to Western Kenya, this is one of the most fertile areas in the world. Um, you know, it's it it has great farming landscapes, it's it's fantastic for farming. And so we said, okay, let's teach these kids how to farm. 
Um, and, and even that picture of Kamani, I find that rather comical because anybody who knows Kamani knows that he's probably one of the worst farmers you'll ever, ever meet. Despite growing up in Western Kenya, um, you know, he is not a good farmer and he'll probably admit to that as well. But we all tried to step out of our comfort zone and said, okay, well, we can get them jobs in farming. Um, and I'm sure anybody else who's on this call who remembers those days, we pushed farming, we tried farming, and the kids, you know, feigned some interest. They did a little bit, but they just simply did not want to farm. These were kids from the city. These were kids in the urban areas who, you know, farming was stuff for the rural areas. These were kids from the city. Uh, and so despite our best intentions and our efforts to respond to needs, it did not work as well as we had hoped. And you can see the picture of the old Tumaini Center. This is where we used to be um, before we had uh, Dinesh and Jennifer and other folks. Um, we had this small little house that we pushed and pushed and pushed to try to make something work. And it worked a little bit, but in all reality, it wasn't a great response to the need. And, and you know, once again, I, I want people, if you remember those days, you know, every now and then you get caught by certain images and certain moments. And the moment that I still remember is, Kim, Kim, you might remember this and you can comment further, but I remember you guys did an activity where you had all the kids write what they wanted to be when they grew up. And so they put it, they put their picture on the wall and then put a, a little tag of what they wanted to be. And there's things like pilot, engineering, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer. And then mean, in the meanwhile, we had a farm in the backyard. And I remember looking at this and saying like, these kids are telling us what they want and we simply aren't equipped to do it yet. So why do we keep doing this? And I remember a, a lot of, you know, it was a lot, it was not as friendly as that, but it was a lot of uh, back and forth of like, we need to do something different and we need to respond to these kids' needs. Um, and so as much as we tried, we, we failed and admittedly we failed, um, but it's okay as long as you kind of course correct uh, and, and um, find a way to respond to the needs. But this was our early effort to try to address the needs of street youth. And it, Kimani, you can feel free to comment at any point because uh, you remember those days better than I do. So I'll, if you don't, that's, I'll, I'll save your, the, the few words that you have for the end just because I don't want to overtax you. But just to show you what, what happened from this kind of awakening and this realization is we actually called back to Tim and who is busy doing residency and all these other things and said, can we do another evaluation and, and brought in other people who could help us do an evaluation of the success of our model. Um, and one of the things that we found, if you can look at the bottom of the slide, is our, our goal was to repatriate them back to their homes um, and get them to a center to get them off the toxic environment of the street and then get them back home and get them into the traditional Kenyan school. Unfortunately, this failed 80% of the time. The 20% of the time that worked, we, we fully support those kids and those kids are doing well to this date and Tim and Kamani can talk about that. But this other 80% just left us feeling like we weren't doing what we set out to do. And for a lot of us who are all putting our own personal funds into this, it just seemed like a poor investment. Um, we weren't getting the outcomes that we wanted in it and we just really had to course correct. And I remember kind of visualizing this and saying like, let's do something different um, and figuring out a way uh, and, and it was a bad time for too many, but eventually we got everybody together and said, here's what our new model should be. And so from this, you know, this rudimentary effort of just setting up a drop-in center, trying to get kids at home and in school, we said, let's correct that. Let's figure out some other way to do that. And the problem was that the kids didn't like school. They didn't like the current version of school they were getting. So these are kids who are on the street, who are probably older than most kids, who are being forced back to a lot of times broken homes and being told that they have to go to a school that is teaching them about Shakespeare, teaching about things that have no relevance to their life and also stigmatizing them because they look different, they act different and it's just not a hospitable environment for these kids. And so we said, why not create an educational model around them? And so we created this ladder model which um, starts with rehabil rehabilitation, counseling and a focus on health. And then we teach them basic literacy and numeracy because we want them to have the basics. But it's this third and fourth step that really is what sets us apart, is we wanted to create an innovative educational center that trains them to do the jobs that they wanted to do and trains them in the areas where they're especially skilled. And so instead of continuing to look down on street kids and being you know, less than or not as good as, if you actually look at these kids at, from a blank slate, you realize that these kids have more resourcefulness, more adaptability, 
and more skills than most most any of us had. I know my kids would never um, have some of the skills that these kids to just survive, where they've survived largely on their own from birth, a lot of these kids. And so, you know, instead of looking down on them, why not look up to them and build a model that actually leverages a lot of their unique strengths? And so that's why we created this innovational educational center model um, and tried to te teach them things that could lead to potential sources of income. And you can see all the trades listed here, but a lot of these were taken directly from the things they wrote on that wall. Um, and once again, this is us trying to listen to the kids and build a model that actually um, responds to what they're telling us they need. So from this, we basically tried to execute the vision and I, I wanna make a, a, a quick call out to all the donors and all the supporters and partners who helped us get this. Um, a lot of you might uh, remember the crowdfunding campaign we recently did, but through your support, we were able to build a dorm to accompany our innovative educational center. Um, and without partners like the ones we've had along the way, so much of what we've talked about simply would not be possible. So I wanna make sure that we thank all of you um, before I turn it over to Dinesh and Jennifer to talk a little bit more about what that infographic looked like. And the other thing I wanna make clear is that we did not have the expertise to do any of those things when we came up with that. That was just done and aligned um, according to the student needs. And once again, this highlights the power of the AMPATH approach when you bring people together with multiple different expertises um, and disciplines, and they're all working towards a common goal, amazing things can happen. And it's never been about credit for any one of us. It's always been about serving those kids. And so it's just a couple of, just an ama amazing set of life lessons that you learn by working with people in Kenya and adopting this AMPATH approach of leading with care um, and bringing together people to do what uh, many people thought could not be done. But Jennifer, Dinesh, and um, Jamani, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, and uh, Sonak, thank you so much. Just to chip in before Jennifer comes on, um, about the slide where um, with the ladder. Because I remember that very point when I was so frustrated with seeing so many of the kids that we had taken back to school and um, almost 80% of them had, uh, you know, gone back to the street. Uh, Sonak has not told you, I wrote a long email to the board to quit. And that was my only time that I had the chance to quit because after that I, I'm hooked now. Um, because I, I thought uh, I should just go back to class. And I remember taking my papers, um, uh, my, my qualifications to the Ministry of Education to be employed as a teacher. And then just about as I, there's a railway that is been between um, town and where the, the Ministry of Education offices are. I called my wife and asked her, do you think it's right for me to quit this job? Because this is really frustrating. And she told me, what do you think? I said, um, I don't think I want to quit. I don't think I want to apply because this is my only chance for me to apply to be a teacher. Um, and from there on, you know, I've continued working with Tumaini. And, 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 and I see uh, at that time, even fundraising was really hard. Um, I could see how much I would strain a team with emails that we were running short in the bank account and his parents because um, his parents were the ones who started fundraising for us from the beginning. And, and, and Sonak has been a bigger our biggest fundraiser for a long time now. And thank you so much for that. And, but even at that time, I, I, I could see his frustration. We were running at a low budget, but it was depending on individual people who would talk to their friends and family to fundraise for Tumaini. And so even that frustration of uh, running an organization that was always depending on the last penny, for me was like, I can't do this. Let me go to the Ministry of Education, get employed, the government has money, and it will keep me going and my family for a long time. But I kept going on. I know it's very interesting that I was looking at our asset base that has gone to about 20 million Kenya shillings with land, buildings, and other assets. And, 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 and even the partnership and the network is way beyond that amount of money. And I think this is because of people who have connected, people who have believed in these children, people who have uh, put um, their energy, their time and life continue working with this and an amazing network of people that have joined us over the time and even a good and passionate staff members who never quit and who are even on call right now working for these children so i think um, it's possible to build something from scratch and um and i and i see many organizations um suffer because you know they started from the top and have really gone down because of um not being sustainable, but to many has organically grown like the ladder shows over here. 
from a small dream discussed by friends over uh, as, as Tim said, Daska. Uh, now, um, for, for the first time in many years, this year I felt like I could stay away from too many and it will still grow. And then that is really, really great. So I'm happy that I've been quit over, over the years and I've continued with this. And, uh, and I hope that many of you join us and you continue supporting us to continue doing what we are doing and do even better. So thank you um, for, the, for the introduction, Sonak, and um, uh, to you, Jennifer, to continue with the next stage. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Kim. Um, I think that's a, a great transition to talking about um, kind of more uh, future facing where we've been and now where we're, we're going. Um, uh, we'll talk a, a, a bit about uh, the growth we've seen in um, just the last five years uh, in our, our work together. Um, and I think it, uh, it's important to say that, that this is uh, a unique um, uh, model that I am hoping that um, the other uh, partners that we work with will continue to learn from. Um, we, in, in some of our work, uh, will refer to um, Tumaini uh, and its whole approach as sort of an emerging center of, of excellence. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, really struck me as, as we've been talking is, is that center of excellence is not a physical thing. It's in the students. And that's really where Tumaini has, has started from, is from the students' expertise um, and how we um, uh, started our work together, Kim, you know, now about five years ago, which is um, kind of uh, startling to, to reflect on. Um, but I think that approach uh, is really why our research group um, has uh, really found a, a home with the, the AMPATH model and in partnership with, with Tumaini. Um, traditional engineering, um, you have to understand what your client needs. Um, so that approach is, is not a, a new thing. Even in, in um, human-centered design, you really have to, as an engineer, build empathy with, um, with the, the client at the end of the day. Um, but our approach is really saying that the expertise is in uh, the students. So it's not just us coming in with a solution and figuring out what uh, the students need, but understanding the expertise that they have as, as engineering and technical leaders now, now recognized in the community and building the kind of facilitating conditions or the, the environment for them to flourish um, as, as engineers for their community. Um, so. Uh, if we, we go to the next slide, you'll see this. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this slide. Maybe let's go to the, the next slide, our timeline slide, um, and we'll come back to that. But you see over the last um, now almost six years, um, we've uh, started from working with the students as experts, um, then uh, expanding that to working with the teachers as experts um, who can help create um, the a more sustainable uh, community uh, of experts at Tumaini, and then even more broadly, uh, expanding out into uh, community leadership. Um, so starting from uh, this picture all the way at the, at the left uh, was now nearly um, six years ago. Um, that's uh, me, uh, but uh, I'm sitting there with uh, um, Kevin and, and Joshua, who uh, again, it's, it's so startling to look back and see how young they look. Um, uh, you'll see Kevin in a, a later video as well. Um, but what we're talking about is not just um, what their interests are and, and what they uh, think they need in a school, but what their, what their areas of expertise are, what they see as their, their own assets. Um, uh, back in 2015, as Tumaini was transitioning to the site where it is now, where many of you um, have seen and, and, and visited um, the school, um, Tumaini was in the process of transitioning to the skill-based education that, that Sonak was, was making reference to. Um, and our research group was just starting to build a, a framework, um, rethinking um, who can be engineers. And so our conversation um, uh, on that day was talking about what are the assets that um, Kevin and Joshua and the other students bring um, as uh, engineers in training. Um, over the next year, um, we continue to um, have those discussions and to um, really use a participatory approach to, to co-create um, the, the engineering curriculum uh, that the students would embark on. Um, 
And then in the next year in 2017 um, was our first implementation, implementation and test of the curriculum. And I think even at that point, that was a good reflection of, of why this approach to engineering and um, the, the AMPATH approach uh, to engagement with, with Tumaini um, is really just a better way of doing things. Um, initially, um, if uh, I know Dinesh remembers this, Kim, you probably remember this too. Our initial goal for the curriculum was um, a solar powered water pump that was gonna be over on the farm. It was gonna help with irrigation. Um, but I think to, to Sonex point, there was a lot of focus on the farm at that point when the students really wanted to focus on um, uh, some of the um, uh, electrical applications um, and, and really what was going on in the school. And so one of the, the videos you'll see later uh, reflects our shift to focusing on um, solar, um, uh, solar energy and so solar photovoltaic power for the school. Um, and, and that shift was certainly facilitated by us, you know, uh, as, a, as a team saying, this is what the students want. This is what the students see as their area of expertise. Um, and so this picture in the middle uh, is really, I think, indicative of, of that shift happening. Um, Kim, I don't know if you wanna maybe briefly explain um, what you are, you and, and who you're with there in that picture in the middle. So this was the um, time the, the U.S. ambassador to Kenya visited um, to Maini. And um, it wasn't because um, he had a planned visit, but because we implored unto him that after his busy time talking to fellow Americans um, um, in, um, in this part of uh, the country, uh, just after Trump became president, that he should pass by. And I think it was such a relief for him to come and see what we are doing away from the rigorous work of being an ambassador at such a difficult time or at such a time in America. So um, it was a great time. He came, visited, and from there, uh, there's been a lot of things that have changed. One of the things that happened is that he, he really encouraged me to apply for um, the state-funded um, prestigious fellowship called YALI. Um, or Mandela Washington Fellowship. And I remember him telling me that I'll come down and mow you, I'll come to Kenya to Eldoret again and mow you down if you don't apply for it. It was very competitive, but I got selected. And um, from there, we've done an, a lot of work um, to, to change what we do at Tumaini. And just to add one more thing that Jennifer said, is that we started, we continued even listening more to what the kids wanted. And, and I think it was us being reminder that it's the kids who run to Maini and the biggest partner or consultant that we should have are not experts, but the kids themselves. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that just to echo that the, the, the students really are the experts. They have such a, a, an important um, uh, set of uh, skills and knowledge about uh, the community, about what works um, and about um, the assets they have. So. I think really centering them as experts has been um, the, the catalyst for, um, for a lot of our success. Um, maybe if you go back one slide, um, right around this time too, is when uh, we were continuing to build some of the connections with um, uh, local, um, uh, uh, local businesses and, and nonprofits here. Um, a number of the, the boys are, are um, uh, doing a site visit uh, with one of the wells. Um, and kind of thinking about what the potential pathways would be um, into uh, uh, work in the community where they could deploy their skills um, uh, in a way that um, would be meaningful for them and uh, uh, sustainable for both them and the community. Um, so if we can go back to the timeline slide now. Um, so at this point, as we were shifting from uh, uh, starting uh, with a small scale, um, uh, understanding the expertise that the students uh, would bring to the curriculum um, and shifting to uh, focus on um, solar PV for this first uh, curriculum. We were also then expanding that, um, uh, uh, that, that um, uh, area around which we were um, kind of bringing in stakeholders. And so um, bringing in the teachers uh, as again, experts in um, what the students need, um, the pedagogies that um, they could deploy and really building up uh, the expertise they have uh, became another uh, important goal for us. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dinesh um, in no small part because uh, this has been the focus of his dissertation work. 
Um, so he can kind of trace the, the second half of this timeline as again, we um, uh, built from a, a, a small um, but a very um, a fertile uh, seed uh, now to this uh, larger scale with the teachers and then the community. Um, thank you, Jennifer. We'll start with the next half of the uh, this timeline. Uh, let me share a quick story, which also connects back to how the approach towards looking at the expertise that's on, on the ground important. When we designed the course, we were looking at using a technology that will deliver the program. So uh, we were research lab situated in the US. We will create the content and put it onto a tablet. Uh, mobile learning platform that the students will use, access, and learn. So we were more interested in working with the students during the initial site visits we did. We did all the discussions with the students, asking them how will they interact and try to understand their uh, comfort levels with the tablets and working with them. Something that we didn't initially think more about is the teachers uh, as how important they were. And we were more interested or, or not personally interested, but thinking deeper is how to improve this mobile platform so that could be more user-friendly and easy access. Um, and the end of the first uh, test pilot program that we did with, where we also did a research to understand how the technology is impacting the learning of the students, we realized that the students were more interested to be working with their teachers um, in, in addition to the mobile learning platform. So that changed our perspective and it put us in a place where we had to expand our system of working with the students and be more participatory and including the teachers as well and, and working, enabling them uh, to become engineering facilitators as well. Uh, I don't know if any of the teachers is on the call. I don't think so. But if they are, they would tell you they were really scared when I said, okay, you're going to be teaching engineering. Um, today, uh, three of them are certified uh, engineering teachers uh, done by the certification program that we launched, uh, which is also my dissertation. Um, and that continued, and we have expanded that program to now eight more, uh, four more teachers from the vocational school. So that's how it's growing. And in, uh, in the following years, in 2019, um, in 2018, we launched the program where one problem, one community problem was solved by the students looking at their own Tumaini community. And the way it went and the way that the students solved, we were able to attract more uh, people from the community coming and asking us, can you solve us these problems that we have in the community that expanded uh, the approach and created the students to look at uh, outside client-based solutions or client-based projects where they were looking, working with people from the outside, not just in Eldoret, but even in Kisumu uh, and trying to address the problems that they were bringing in. And uh, you will see at the last picture there, which is a very emotional moment and a wonderful moment too, where uh, all the students at the end of the second version of engineering program were fired and received Purdue transfer credits. Um, did I freeze? The second way. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so they were uh, last year at the end of December. We had this huge celebration where they were able to reflect on their learning and receive this uh, credits from Purdue and also their certifications on engineering and moved on to, as Kimani was saying, uh, to their next steps and roles. Some of them have. Um, become employees uh, with uh, people who are business people in, in town. And some of them are looking at entrepreneurship um, as their next opportunity and growing into those positions. And even leading to uh, the current year, given the situation that we are in, um, the uh, very uncommon place where, that we are all in, uh, we are reflecting back and trying to understand the role that engineering could play and is actually playing in the mental health of these students as well. So one of the hypotheses that we are thinking about and trying to understand more in the coming days is um, how is engineering supporting, uh, providing psychosocial support and socio-emotional learning for the youth here that we can understand better and create better teaching and learning opportunities for um, the youth uh, that we will work with at Tumaini and beyond that, 
as our research lab uh, continues to work with other populations. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I want to highlight a few things that was already discussed, but quickly as uh, Sonak, Jennifer, and Kim was rightfully mentioning about the asset-based model, that was one of the first steps. It was one of the successful models that we have generated out of our approach and understanding uh, where engineering traditionally has, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, has been looking at the engineer's self-interests over the community. And by looking at the asset-based approaches where we are looking at both from the perspective of the context, uh, what are the readily available resources in the context and how we can build on them and also of the population uh, such as street youth who have demonstrated higher amount of resilience, uh, social cohesion and self-esteem uh, and self-agency that we can build uh, towards uh, learning a complex and challenging program like engineering. If we could go to the next slide, right. Uh, I want to quickly highlight that uh, the program at Tumaini, and it's not just only benefiting, or, or it, it grew uh, over the last five years, not only benefiting the students at uh, Tumaini, but over the time, we were able to integrate it uh, with the students in the U.S. as well, uh, through a couple of different programs where we have shown success in, in cross-cultural learning and uh, interdisciplinary uh, approaches towards uh, leading uh, teaching and learning program within engineering. Um, so our localized engineering education program at Tumaini has three different or three main uh, uh, parts of the curriculum. And we were able to see as we were running these uh, phases uh, over the year that we are able to bring in students from the U.S. in different places where both the students in the U.S. and the Tumaini and the community at Tumaini, including the teachers, are able to work together uh, and benefit in terms of uh, different learning outcomes. For example, uh, the study abroad program that we have run for the last three years, um, we've been able to reflect and understand the success of it by being able to align the designing of the study abroad program based on the participatory principles that Tumaini uh, started with by working with the teachers and the students and the administration and how this program should be shaped um, and finally, uh, recently, we also co-authored a publication along with the teachers at Tumaini uh, and de designed a new innovative framework that uh, engineering study abroad should adhere to when working with non-traditional contexts, particularly in low and middle income countries. And we also work with first year engineering students at, uh, 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 at Purdue who also collaborate with Tumaini at the end of their design challenge uh, classes. Uh, that currently is ongoing as Jennifer is teaching one uh, and we'll be working with Tumaini as well. So, so the, the way that we have been able to integrate and create a synergy in terms of learning outcomes, not just benefiting one group of population, but looking at the importance of the community uh, is clearly an example of the care, leading with care model that AMPATH has, uh, has demonstrated over the years as successful. Uh, and in the next few slides, I just want to leave it to the students and the teachers themselves demonstrating the impact of what we have um, been able to achieve. And in this video, you'll see Kevin Nyaga and Benga sharing their first version of the engineering program and uh, what problem they learned and solved over a period of time. So if we could play the video. Tell me how you installed the solar panels up there. So first of all, we identify and see where is the problem actually in Tumaini. And then we came and found the problem is electricity loss. So they sometimes, maybe once a week or twice a week, electricity goes and it gone for a long time. So it's like we came and realized, found an idea how can we solve that problem as engineer. And then we came and we decided to use a solar panel. And then we just learned through modules, classes, which we, there's a curriculum called QDEX we are using to learn. So we learn about how to install a solar panel, how the energy of solar, how can you fix a solar and how can you make it. And we calculate the power that Tumaini need to, to light all the bulbs at Tumaini at, during at night. And then we found the calculation and then we came up and installed the solar panel. So in the video, you just saw Kevin Nyaga and Benger, who are both now graduated from their uh, program at Tumaini and is uh, in their high school program 
um, and Kevin's aspiration is to be the next Tumaini director. So um, we're grooming him towards that, Kim is very rightfully. And to quickly share, Kevin uh, made me realize and challenged my assumptions personally when I started as a student as well. Initially, when I used to visit Tumaini and uh, do the classes, um, I would work with a teacher to help me translate in the classes, particularly when some of the engineering, uh, when I had no Kishwahili uh, knowledge uh, per se. And one of the days the teacher was not there in the classroom and I had to convey something important and I could see the students' faces that they were not understanding. And as I was looking perplexed, Kevin stood up and said, I can help you translate. Um, and that made me realize, why was I thinking that I needed a teacher when Kevin is totally capable of being uh, the communicator where it was needed. So uh, an internal expertise that was there from that day, it was the students uh, uh, who helped each other with their translations, who worked as their peer supporters uh, throughout the engineering programs that we have taught in the last four years. Uh, in this slide, I wanted to uh, show ta uh, Francis who is talking about the problem solving that Kevin just explained and they were able to uh, solve a problem at Tumaini and how that translate, translated to opportunities outside of Tumaini, so. Um, <clears throat> some people in society came to see that, well, how to fix the solar. Then he told the teachers, when I need a solar, me and teachers go to fix the solars for him. So there Francis was saying about how he was able to go forward and work with people outside in the community, which is an interesting story too, because initially when Tumaini was there, uh, the community, uh, Kimani can correct me, was not a, a very supportive of Tumaini being situated in the place. Uh, because of the assumptions and the stigma that they had about who street youth were or who street youth are. Um, and the work that they were able to solve and create or build a solar photovoltaic system for their own school challenged the perceptions of the community as well and brought in more uh, connection with the, with the local community. So you saw that from the perspective of the students and I wanna share uh, a quick perspective from the teachers as well as to how they grew from being scared of engineering programs uh, to what they're gonna say now. How do you see yourself progressing like becoming a better engineering teacher in the future? Um, very good question. Uh, <laughs> I think a few weeks before uh, the team came, I was talking to Ignatius and I was telling him that I see um, some potential in me becoming an engineer teacher in the future. Uh, why? Because they have done such an excellent work in teaching us how to become engineers and also how to teach. And also using the QDEX app that we've been using in the tablet, it has simplified, I think that's what you call it, simple engineering. Uh, it has simplified what uh, someone like me thought uh, was for engineers, those people who are being called to be engineers and not for people like us. And um, I think with uh, the courses that we still we still have to cover and also with the trainings and the journey and the WhatsApp calls and everything that we're doing, that for me is a very, very great advantage for me to become even a better teacher. And so I, I am working closely in to ensure that I get as much as I can so that I can continue teaching to the other in the future. Yeah, and even designing our own yeah. Uh, because, yeah, because engineers solve problems, that's all I had. And I believe we can solve problems by designing our own courses. So I'm looking forward in the future to be the one designing the engineering courses at my own. Yeah, and to add on to that, uh, the engineering design process that um, we're talking about here, I have been able to actually implement that in other areas in Tumaini, like some of the structures that we're coming up with, we are using the same design. So for me, it's not just teaching engineering, um, being a teacher in it, but also learning how to take what we are learning and implementing it in other things and also teaching others to take up the same design 
Right. So from, from what you just heard, uh, to briefly uh, summarize is that what they're trying to say is, uh, I am no longer needed, uh, though I'm here in Eldred right now, uh, to design and run the engineering program at Tumaini. This video was taken two years before, and now they have been certified. Sally is designing an after-school engineering program to work with other youth in the community. Uh, Wesley and uh, Esther, who are the other two teachers, are mentoring the new four teachers who are uh, learning to teach engineering as well. So the community uh, at Tumaini currently is capable of designing their own engineering curriculum and running their programs. Um, so the engineering center at Tumaini, the program that we designed uh, is continuing to create impact and, and we have been able to design not just a curriculum, but then uh, an ecosystem, a learning ecosystems that provides learners and, uh, and the teachers at Tumaini with a pathway that they can proceed further after uh, finishing up their program. Uh, and even helping us to understand better ways of being able to deliver engineering programs around the world and challenge the assumption that uh, Jennifer stated about earlier about who can be an engineer. So with that, I'll pass on back to uh, Sonak. Thank you, Dinesh. So I, I know we're at the end of the hour. I, I, I can stay on for 10 to 15 more minutes if people have questions, but if you have to drop off, we understand. Uh, but I wanted to just take a second and see if anybody had any questions that they wanted to chat, um, they're welcome to. Uh, but I wanted to at least close with one final comment that these same kids that you see in the pictures here are the same kids from those earlier pictures. Um, and with just a little bit of support, structures that are designed around their unique talents, they can do all the amazing things that we dreamed they could do. And now we're just proving it to the rest of the world. Um, I just wanna, if anybody has a question, you can ask it now. But I had three or four more slides just to wrap up. Um, if, if nobody has questions. I think, uh, Kimani, there was a question about how many students now. I know coronavirus has disturbed uh, everything, but if you want to comment on that, please go ahead, Kim. Yeah, so right now we have uh, 28 um, students in the vocational school, including community students, um, because um, we did such an amazing work at Tumaini and convinced the community by solving some of the challenges they faced. Uh, including, you know, a lot of them having challenges during power outages and burglary. And we have designed a solar alarm system. <laughs> and um, because of that, a lot of community kids are interested to come and study at Tumaini at a fee, subsidized for the kids that, um, that are studying uh, from the streets that we offer free sponsorship. Um, and then we have eight kids who are in a primary school. Uh, so, yeah. And... Um, We've also been supported by the government just recently to rescue children from the streets and take them home because of COVID-19. And we were able to support 203 to go back home. And out of those 41 of them are interested to come back to Mania, especially to study in the vocational school. Great, thank you. So, so Kim mentioned this video of one of the, the things that the kids worked on building. So I thought I would just show that video so you can complete Kim's story. You got plenty of I just wanted to share one more story because I, I think it brings everything together and ties into Ampath as well. Um, so I think Benson, I'm hoping, was able to join. Um, but I just wanted to br very briefly share his story because it's a testament to what the Ampath program is about. Um, Benson had, had just randomly picked up this picture from many, many, many years ago. Um, and I think, you know, with leaders like Joe Mamlin, much of what we talk about is possible. 
And this picture, once again, is just a testament to the AMPATH approach. So this was Joe Mamlin when before, when they were doing HIV work and just setting up this IU program, they would go to the rescue center and provide healthcare services to the couple of kids who needed it. Uh, and one of these kids was Benson Caragu, who some of you might know. Uh, and so Joe realized that he had asthma and also had um, ocular issues that would potentially lead to him becoming blind. So Joe, in typical Joe fas fashion, took Benson under his wings and found out a way to get his healthcare needs addressed. And, and why this picture is so interesting is that this, the other lady in this picture is one of my colleagues, Ellen Shellhouse, who's the founder of much of what we do at Purdue. And just this simple act of simple collaboration that was probably a trivial thing in their day-to-day -day work um, is what allows Benson's story to be told today. And what I wanna emphasize to people is these little things that you do that probably don't mean much in that day can lead to huge, big changes later on. These simple acts of kindness can make all the difference in the world. And the reason why I say that is that this small investment of, two, of Empath in Kenya, and then Joe Mamlin deciding on his time and, and Sarah Ellen to go to the rescue center to help a couple of kids is what led to the story of Benson being told. So Benson, despite being a former street youth, was also one of the few selected people to be a Mandela Washington fellow. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention that I used to work for USAID uh, and my office was right next to the people who were reviewing these. Just to give you context for this, there's roughly about 40 to 50,000 applicants across Africa that apply for this program and they take about 500 to 700. We've had Kimani get it, we've had Benson get it, and a couple of other um, Ampath employees get it as well. Just to give you a sense of how special and talented these people are. Benson was also a finalist for the top 35 under 35. And now all the people who've invested in Benson, whether it's for his medical needs, his educational funds, um, he is now one of the leads for our community-based care efforts and also volunteers at Tumaini. So you can see how that little effort that was given way back when, many, many years ago, has led to all of these ripple effects that we now get the joy of listening to and, and hearing about. Um, and I think it's always important to take time and reflect on some of these wins because with so many failures that we're seeing now, I think it's important to acknowledge the wins when they happen and what simple acts actually allowed those wins to happen. So with that, I'll, I'll finish up. Um, Benson, if you're on the, on the group, um, please feel free to give a couple of comments, but I'll uh, open it to any questions or um, final comments from others who've had a chance um, to be part of Two Miney. And I also want to thank all the all the uh, partners we've had over the years who've made it possible for us to do this.